the the subject of the 144,000 is one of those really uh, controversial subjects as far as um, the book of Revelation is concerned. And almost everybody you talk to has a different idea about who the 144,000 are. Um, I, one thing I've discovered is that if you are going to study, study any subject, you need to have a, a, a an understanding of the the broader picture, because if you if you get the, the the broader easy to fit the parts, whereas if you don't see the broader picture, you try to fit square pegs into round holes. You try to put things where they don't belong. You just listen, and I think we're all understanding this because that is one of the the things we have been looking at and studying from week to week. So, on this question of the one fourth, well, it's true. Who are these one forty four thousand? Why are they mentioned revelation? What what is God trying to say to these people? Why does He bring them up at all? Now, I'm going to kind of give you, I'm going to give you in a broad outline what I want to be the context of the book of Revelation. I, I, I'm going to do that. I promise that some other time we're going to take a closer look at what I'm about to say now. Now, the book of Revelation is 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 the final. It's the final chapter in the great that's taken place over the ages between two great kingdoms. Please remember this. Final chapter in the, in the great conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of the beast. If you look at it in the context of the prophetic scenario of Jesus Christ versus the kingdom of the beast. It's the kingdom of the kingdom of Satan. This is a conflict that has been taking place from the beginning of time. It continues today. It's final conflict. It's its final climax. It reaches, it reaches its final climax in the book of Revelation. And with that kind of background, see if you can fit the different parts. Who are the one for the four thousand? Who is the beast? What is what is the purpose of the mark of the beast? What is the seal of God? What what are the trumpets? That con context of the last great conflict between these two kingdoms. So the one forty four thousand is in there. Some to say that the one forty four thousand. Here here is my my description of who they are. Where we start the study. The one forty four thousand is a final part of the kingdom of 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 God. It's the it's it's the it's the it's a showpiece. Let me use a word from understanding. The 144,000 is a showpiece of God's kingdom. In other words, these are the people that God will use to enter the universe. I'm going to show you what being of, of God really means. Now, you and I are a part of God, but up to this point, up to this, none of us has ever demonstrated. In, 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 the, in the fullest way a gospel can do in a person. None of us has ever done this. We don't, we don't have to do this in order to be saved. Who, who, who have Christ. We are going to be saved. That is never in question. 44,000 are, are a group of people that God has chosen. In whom he's display his glory. In full display. That is who the one 44,000 are. Now. We're going to go more deeply into, into the subject and see if we can understand that. Now I'm going to just um I'm going to go to the Bible and I'm also going to illustrations to kind of support what I'm I'm saying. So let's go to the Bible first of all. And um we're all are aware that there are two places in the book where the one forty four thousand is mentioned. And um, we're going to look at those two places. Uh, the first place is in 7, and the next place is in Revelation 14. And um, of course, I believe that there is a reason why they are mentioned twice. Revelation, the first part of Revelation 4 until chapter 11, description of the events of the end of time. But it is perspective of the kingdom of God. The emphasis. It's it's it, the emphasis. If you look at Revelation, if you look at those chapters, I think that is taking place in heaven. The first 
in, in the first part of the, the, the section, in chapter 4, John is taken up into heaven and he sees something happening. <laughs> this is where John, John looks and he sees the book and he sees the throne of God and he sees the four living creatures. This is where John sees what is happening in the first part of the book. In the second part of the book, from about verse, from about chapter 12, this is on something happening on earth. It's, it's on the, the, the beast coming and the beast coming from the earth and the, 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 the events that happen, the perspective of what is happening from the point of view of Satan's two different sections. Section one, the kingdom of Christ. Section two, the kingdom of, of course, Satan's kingdom is involved in what is happening in God's kingdom. God's kingdom is involved in what is happening in Satan's kingdom. So you have some overlapping. The, the main emphasis in part one is the kingdom of God. And then part two is how Satan's kingdom is being dealt with. So until I give you the background to this, that may not make a lot of sense, but I just want to general way. So you have the 144,000 revealed in part one. And you see the 144,000 again in part two. That's why we see the 144,000 mentioned a couple of times. Now, let's see when these, these, this 144,000 is first mentioned. It says in Revelation 7, that's the first place, 144,000. Now, remember the question that we are dealing with. The question is, who are the 144,000? To answer a question that somebody asked me somewhere else. Somebody asked me, that this number is not a literal number. So as we go through the day, I'm going to explain that as well. I'm going to give my reasons why I believe this. So in Revelation 7, after these are four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. But let's put that in context. All right. Um, I'm going to use an illustration here. I'm going to come back to the Bible, but I want to use an illustration because sometimes I find we remember things better if we are an illustration. So, um, all right. So, before we come to chapter 7, just before we see the 144,000, this is the last thing I read about in chapter 6. If you go back to chopping up the verses at the moment, but if you go back to chapter six of Revelation, you find that it, the, the angel opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. You can see that illustrated here with the where there was falling. There was a great earthquake and um, heaven fell and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair and it was blood. And I think Brother Howard read the, the verse this morning where it says that all the and, and the rich men and every free man and every bondman mountains to hide themselves in the dens and in the caves of the mountain. And this is what they say. They say, hide us from the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? It's important that we consider the great day of God's wrath has come. Now, I don't believe that this day has yet arrived. But it's coming. And then it says, who shall be able to stand? This question in the book of Revelation. Why does God ask the question? Well, let me give you, let me, let me emphasize that it will be helpful in studying these prophecies. Where it asks a question. It is not because he does not know that God knows the answer. So why does he ask a question? It's because he wants you to question. All right. And I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. There, there's something else in this study that is the same exact way, exact, exact point. So God asks the question because what he's really saying is, I wanted to think about the question because I'm about to give you an answer. I wanted to think about the question because I'm about to give you an focus on the answer. So the, 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 the Lord says, the angel says, or whoever is speaking, the, 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 these these men into the rocks and the mountains they ask the question but it's really god who, who who is because it's it's a prophecy from god and so so the god's wrath has come and who shall be able to stand so the question is when the great wrath arrives who will be able to stand that is a question 
Now it is in this context something happening. We see four angels. They are standing on the four corners of the earth and they are holding the foot and they are not allowing the winds to blow on the earth. And there comes an angel from the east and he has the seal of the living God. These four angels and he tells them, hold the winds, don't allow them to be released on the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now let's re remind ourselves of the question. The question was, who shall be able to stand? And immediately John sees four angels and they are told to, and they are to hold the winds until God's servants have been sealed. So the answer to the question, the answer to the question is obviously when it's done, the answer to the question is those who are sealed with the seal of the living God, they are the ones who will be able to stand. I hope you, in other words, that statement about the sealing of the one for the four thousand isolation, it's in context. And right away, this tells you the one for the four thousand are. It tells, at, at least it answers questions. These one for the four thousand are people who live to stand during the great day of God's wrath. They are the people who are able to stand during the great day of God's wrath. Now, now why this is important? Because you have so many different ideas. The Jehovah's Witness, they say that the one for the four thousand were taken up to heaven in 1914. Yes, they say they will still remain on earth, but they say most of them were taken up in 1914. And they are old people now, and every time one of them dies, he goes straight to heaven. And I believe in, in, in that thing about when you die, you go to heaven, but it's only for the one for the 4,000. Many Adventists believe that, and many of the Adventist pioneers will also be among the one for the 4,000. The reason why they believe this is because they think Sister White is supposed to some, that these pioneers, she saw them among the one for the 4,000. Some statement, and because an angel said to Ellen White, if you are faithful, the one for the 4,000 will be able to eat from the tree of life. So they take and they say, well, clearly Ellen White and they, and many of the adventures will be among the one for the 4,000. Other that the one for the 4,000 is a group of people who are See out of the Adventist church, out of, out of those who keep the, keep the commandments and so on. And it's, it's a kind of, leg, it's, it's based on legalism. But let me tell you what, they, be, they believe that these out of these people, God is going to take one for the 4,000. The Shah are very strong on this belief. Now they believe that this one for the 4,000, when they're out of the Adventist church, then the rest of Adventism will be condemned. As a matter of belief that an angel of death, some of them believe that they are the one, an angel will pass through and kill everybody else. In, a, in the Adventist church, the of Ezekiel 9, the angel will pass through with the weapon, with the, with the slaughter of the Adventists. And then now the one for the 4,000 who were sea church, they are going to go and win other people to, 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 to the gospel. And they are going to win a great multitude to the mess. But this multitude will be different from the one for the 4,000. So the one for the 4,000, general people who will preach, and then they will win a great multitude. So, of course, this great preaching work cannot begin until these 1,000 are sealed. So these are some of the beliefs, and that's why I am emphasizing what God says here through these people. Through these, the, when he says, the great day of his wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? If you understand the day of God's wrath, you will understand why these ideas, what is the great day of God's wrath? Let's go to the Bible and just answer that question. Um, let's go back to... Um, the Bible here, and if you the book of Revelation in chapter 15, look at what it says. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven legs, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The wrath of God is filled up in the seven last plagues. So when the great day of God's wrath arrives, we are talking about the seven last plagues, all right? And the last plagues are poured out upon the planet. It is because the day of sin is past. Nobody can be saved after that time. The, the full up is when God has completely abandoned planet Earth. God's, the fullness of God's wrath is poured out. You know, if, if there is a, when mercy, when God's mercy is involved, then it's not the fullness of God's wrath. It's God's wrath with mercy. I hope what I'm trying to say. So when it says 
the fullness of God's wrath, it's when no longer any mercy, the time of salvation is past. Every person has made his decision. Every, everybody is finally settled as to where he belongs. And so the last place, that is the day of God's wrath. And um, who shall be able to stand in this time of God's wrath? It shows us that it will be those who are sealed, which is the one forty four thousand. The one forty four thousand is not going to go out and preach to any and multitude after that time because nobody else can be saved after that point. Everybody made his decision. And and um these people are not Adventists who come back to life, or some of them at least are not dead Adventists who come back to life. Those dead Adventists, they never stood in the time of God's wrath. They never stood, never passed through the great tribulation. They are dead and gone before the throne. So they, they are not a part of the 144,000. The 144,000 are those who are able to stand at that time. And we are going to see some other evidences that further reinforce this point. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying simply is that, is, is that the 144,000 group of people who live in the last moments of time and represent God in the last moments of time and who are sealing of the living God in the last moments of time. They are God's peace in which he displays the, the, the in full and final glory. These are the people that are alive on planet Earth. There's nobody else who is a Christian. Who Some of us will die before that. Those who remain alive, you will be a part of the one for them. So let's see what we can figure out about these people as we continue. Let's read on. After these things, I saw four angels. I'm going to go down to about verse 11, then I'm going to stop and go back to some illustrations, all right? But I want us to get this picture in our mind of, of these people. So, this is the four angels, and they are holding the winds that they should not blow. And then he says, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. With a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till the servants of God in their foreheads. Notice what is to happen. These angels have the power to hurt the earth and the sea. Last week we were discussing of what does earth mean and what does sea mean. And we suggested that the sea means the sea focuses on, on the old, that part of the earth which was traditionally highly popular in the, prophecy, the times of the prophecy. But now, in a general, it represents the old world and the earth representing the new world, that part of the world. But notice that the angels have the power to hurt both the earth and the sea, meaning that what is coming is universal. It's not going to be located in just one part. It's the entire planet that is going to experience this. This is what is referred to as the day of God's wrath. Revelation 7 Revelation 6 says, the day of his wrath, who shall be able to stand? Revelation 7 says, let me take you back a little bit and show you who will be able to stand. So if you understand, the question at the end of chapter 6, under the seventh seals, all right, God's wrath has arrived. God's day of wrath has arrived. You can stand in this day. To answer the question, you have to go back before the day arrived and look at the preparation that is made for people to stand at that. So chapter 7 is really taking us back before seal numbers. Do we all understand what I just said? If you don't, give me a sound. It's, 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 understand, but I, understand, I know that when one person is talking, sometimes you kind of zone out and sometimes a, a, an important point misses you. But is there anybody who did not understand what I just said? Let me know. Let me go back over it. All right. Eat. All right, Brother Arthur. Right. Thank you. Um, saying is that revelation the chapters in revelation are a sequence like you're reading a storybook but sometimes you come to a point in the story where something is being said and it doesn't make sense and so story stops and the author gives you a flashback to something that happened before sometimes you're watching movies and you see that happening right you see something happening you don't know what's going on here and then they give you a flashback to show you something that happened earlier and then you say oh that makes sense there are several of these flashbacks in the book of Revelation. And this is one of them. Chapter 7 is a flashback. Because see what has been happening? If you go from chapter 5, chapter 6, the seals are being opened. Seal 1, number number 1, number 2, number 3, 
Number four. Number five. And then number six says, the great day of wrath has come. And who is able to stand? So the question has to be answered. Who can stand? So God says, okay, I'm going to answer that question. Let me give you a flashback to show you some people who, are be, who will be prepared so that they can stand when that great day of wrath comes. So chapter 7 is a flashback. In chapter 7, God takes you and steps back to a period before seal number 6. Because remember, if seal number 6 represents the great day of God's wrath, then this sealing of the one for the 4,000 has to take place before that time. So chapter 7, which is answering the question, takes you in a flashback. All right, so I hope that is, I hope the second time it's clearer. All right, so the angel says, back to, to chapter 7, we are, we are within the flashback now. So an angel is coming from the east and he has a seal of the living God and he cries to the angels who have the power to hurt the earth and the sea. These angels are the ones that are going to release the winds, meaning that after these angels let go, then the seven last plagues are going to come. The great day of God's wrath is, is wrapped up in these four winds, these seven, sea, seven plagues. So this angel with the seal of God, he says, do not hurt the earth. Do not hurt the sea. Do not hurt the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So, Nothing is to happen until God's servants have been sealed. Obviously, once they have been sealed, then bang, the winds are going to be released. The great day of wrath is going to come. So the sealing of the one forty four thousand is one of the important events that has to happen before we actually come to the end of time. In verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of them that were sealed. This is an, imp this is an important point. I'm going to refer back to it. So. I encourage you to take note of what it says. Everything that it says here is important because if you don't see what is being said, you, you get confused. John says, I heard the number of them which were sealed. Now, just let me ask you something. Since we all are familiar with the book of Revelation, where is John at this point? In the vision, where is John? Give you a moment to think about that and then I'll answer, all right? In actual fact, John is in heaven, right? John is not. John is actually at this point in heaven, and um, I'll show you what he's doing there. If you go back to chapter chapter four, let me go back to chapter four. In chapter four, John says, after this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And John, John is gone through that open door in heaven and he sees God sitting on his throne. John is in heaven and um, he sees the book of the seven seals and he sees the lamb opening the seals. And look at what he says. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. So he's telling you, I heard and I saw, I heard and I saw. Whatever he's seeing, he's telling what he sees. He sees an altar. He sees an angel offering up incense. He's describing what he sees. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I mentioned this to you some time ago, that I got a lot of insight because I went through the book of Revelation and I drew a picture of everything that I saw, everything that, that it says. I drew a picture and I started to see things. John is in heaven and he's standing there and he's telling you what he's seeing, right? So back to our point here in Revelation chapter 4, chapter seven and verse four he says i heard the number of them which were sealed what did he see he saw four angels four angels standing on the four corners of the earth he saw another angel coming from the east he he hears the number of those which are sealed he does not see them he hears that's a very important point as we continue to study this issue. So here's the number of them which were sealed, and there was sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And it goes on to tell you what were the tribes that were sealed. I won't go through them at this point, right? I'll come back to it in a moment. It mentions the tribes, the 12 tribes, and it mentions 12,000 were sealed from each tribe. And in verse 9, 
It says, after this, I beheld. Now he tells you what he sees. After this, I beheld. After this, I see. Notice, let me remind you what he saw. He saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. He saw another angel from the, coming from the east with the seal of the living God. He saw nothing else. He heard the number of those that were sealed. And it tells you where they came from. I know the next thing he says, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, kindred, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne. So he's still in heaven. He's still before the throne of God, and he's telling you, first of all, he saw four living creatures there. He saw the lamb standing before the throne. He saw the great multitude of angels around the throne. But now he says he sees a great multitude of people that no man can number standing before the throne. They have on white robes, they have on white robes, important, and they have palms in their hand. Let me go back and share my, my, my pictures for just a moment. All right, so first of all, let me comment on the, the tribes. These are not the 12 tribes of Israel. There, there, are, there are two tribes missing, and there's one tribe there that does not belong there. Um, those of us who are not so familiar with what happened with the, with the tribes of Israel, we might not understand. But there's no tribe of Joseph and there's no tribe of Levi among the 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, before Jacob died, Jacob told Joseph that his two sons were to inherit instead of him, Joseph. And the two sons of Joseph were Ephraim and Manasseh. So Ephraim the son of Joseph gained an inheritance among the 12 tribes and Manasseh also gained an inheritance. So they made up the 12 tribes, but that would have made 13 because Joseph, Jacob had 12 sons. And if Joseph put in two tribes, that would have made 13 tribes. But, it, but to make up for that, the tribe of Levi was taken out of the 12. God took Levi out of the 12 tribes and God says, Levi will have no inheritance in Israel because Levi were, were, were made into an, a tribe of priests. So the entire tribe of Levi was a priest, the Levites. And so they had no inheritance among the 12 tribes. But in Revelation here, for some reason, God has changed things up. He, he brings back in Levi and he puts him among the 12. And he takes out Ephraim. He leaves Manasseh, the other son. But he takes out Ephraim and he puts back in the father, Joseph. And he puts back in Levi and he takes out the tribe of Dan. So Dan is missing. And Ephraim is missing, and Joseph and Levi have gone back in. So that's a strange thing about these tribes in Revelation. And what exactly does it mean? To be honest, I cannot give you a perfect answer. Some people have suggested that um, Dan was a tribe that was outstanding in idolatry. And maybe that's the reason, right? Um, in, in, a play, in one place in the Old Testament, it says that Dan is a serpent. When, when um, Jacob was prophesying of, the, of what the tribes would do, he, he says, Dan is a serpent standing by the way or lying by the way. He will bite the, the, the heels of the, the rider, something like that. And of course, Ephraim, Ephraim became the head of the 12 tribes that, um, the 10 tribes that rebelled, the 10 tribes that rebelled against the line of David and became the, the other 10 tribes of Israel. They came to be known as Ephraim. And they were, they, they of course rejected God and they turned to idolatry. So maybe that's why Ephraim is removed. I don't know. Because when it says e Ephraim is bound to his idol, leave him alone. Right. There's that statement in Hosea as well, where God, referring to those 10 tribes, God says, Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. So, so Ephraim came to be representative of those 10 tribes that rebelled. So maybe that's why Ephraim is missing. I don't know. But in any case, it won't affect how we view the 144,000. But here's something that I want us to consider. Um, let me see if I have this on my list. All right, I'm going to come back to this. All right, I'll just, I'll just deal with it here. Is this 144,000 a literal number? Now, at one point, I believed that it was a literal number. And I promoted the idea that it is a literal number, but I don't believe this anymore. And um. I believed it was a literal number primarily because, I mean, I, I, I got my understanding of prophecy from an Adventist background. And I got a lot of help 
but also there were some things that they, be, they were a bit of a hindrance. Um, so, you know, Ellen White makes a statement. She says that the 144,000, the living saints, she mentions the living saints, 144,000 in number. And I, 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 on, I interpreted that, like many people, to mean that she's saying the living saints is exactly 144,000. It could be that that is what she means, but it could also be that that is not what she means. But in any case, I, I prefer to these days to, 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 to stick with the Bible, especially when I'm interpreting things like prophecy. But the first question I ask myself is, I'm going, is, 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 a, is a question regarding the way we reason. It's the first question you see on the screen. How does a literal number help? What I'm, I mean is that every number in, in the book of Revelation, every, every bit of information in the book of Revelation is supposed to help us in, in what is coming. It's supposed to help us in some kind of way. Now, suppose that all the people who lived through the last time of trouble is exactly 144,000. Not 144,001. Not 139,999 but exactly 144,000. Suppose that's the exact number. Please tell me, who is going to go around and count? How is that going to help me and you? How, how will I know that we have 144,000 people? Are we going to do a census? Are we going to have a church membership that we, we count how many? I mean, the shepherds right, might be doing something like that, but I mean, those of us who, 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 who think a little more carefully, we, re we realize that in the time of trouble, in the conflict that is coming, we are not going to be going around numbering how many people are involved. That's not our business. That's God's business. So why would a literal number of exactly 144,000 be necessary for us to know? Because it cannot help us to know whether there, there is exactly 144,000 or not. So that's the first reason that makes me think. Think about it. This number is likely to be a number with a spiritual significance instead of a literal number. That's the first reason. Let me add something to that. The numbers in Revelation, the numbers in prophecy generally, they are intended to give a character evaluation. Let me say this. Most of the numbers, especially in prophecy, they are designed to give a character evaluation or an evaluation of some characteristic they are not literal numbers for example when it says that in in revelation chapter 5 it says jesus has seven horns and seven eyes the lamb that john saw first of all is a lamb jesus is not a lamb he has seven horns it's kind of stupid for anybody to say that because it says seven jesus has seven seven horns or seven eyes literally we know that seven means complete, right? That's how we understand the, the number seven. It's, it's, a, it's an evaluation number. It's a characteristic evaluation. It's not a numerical value. This is why people who say that the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne represent seven angels, I think they're also very foolish because what they are doing, they are, they are, they are suggesting that God has seven literal spirits instead of understanding that the number seven is an evaluation number to say that the characteristic of perfection, the characteristic of complete, completeness is what God is focusing on in this number seven. Now, the number 12 is a similar number. Wherever you see the number 12, it usually is associated with the kingdom of God. It's God's kingdom number. It's a number that that's, uh, signifies the characteristics of God's kingdom. Let me give you examples. The, 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 the type of the kingdom is the tribes of Israel. The type of God's kingdom was Israel, literal Israel. And literal Israel had 12 tribes. The foundation of the kingdom of God, the, the real kingdom now, is the 12 apostles, and there are 12 persons involved. We are told that the foundation of the new Jerusalem has, there are 12 foundations, and there are 12 gates. And, and the, 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 the height of the city is 144,000 cubits. It's 12 12 144. And the length of the city is 144,000 cubits. 12 12 144. And the number 
of the perfected kingdom is 144,000. The 144,000. The number, it seems to me, it's shouting at us that this is not a literal number. It's a number representing characteristic. It's, it's character value. It's a characteristic of the kingdom. God is saying, this is the kingdom perfected. 12 twelves, 144, 144. It's 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. God divided it, divides it up in detail, but he focuses on, he's focusing on the characteristics of the kingdom, not the number of people, not a literal number of people. As I pointed out that a literal number does not help us at all, but a number that has a, a, a spiritual characteristic is valuable because it tells us something about who these people are and the kind of people they are and what, what place they hold in God's plan at that moment in time. The second point I want to make why I don't think it's a, a literal number is that a literal number would indicate that it's a predestinated group. Now, what do I mean by predestinated? It means that if there's 144,000 and you are number 144,000 and one, as we say in Jamaica, you have no hope of getting in. When the 144,000 number finish, God says, bang, I'm closing the door. Nobody else can get in. It's kind of strange because God does not, God does not deal with people that way. Where there is somebody who still can make it, God does not close the door. But this suggests if it's a literal number, God is saying, I'm waiting on that last number. And anywhere I have to find the last one, I'll find him. And once he's in there, bang, the door is closed. It's not characteristic of the way God, God does things. The third reason why I don't think it's a literal number is because you have to be consistent. It's 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. If you say it's a literal number, then it means it's literal Israel. That is probably the simplest point that I can make. So if Israel is not literal Israel, we say that, it, 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 although it says Israel, we understand that. We understand that God is using Old Testament language in the book of Revelation. It's full of the Old Testament. What we do, we take the Old Testament and we apply the New Testament meaning. When you see a lamb, a slain lamb, you understand that it means Jesus Christ. You're not looking for a young sheep. When you see 12 lamps of fire, you understand it represents the Holy Spirit. You're not looking for literal lamps of fire in heaven. So everything you translate. So when it says that this is Israel from the tribes of Israel, you understand it means spiritual Israel. That is Christians, not Jews. And therefore, when it says the number 144,000, you give it a spiritual meaning, not a literal meaning. So this is my reason for concluding that. You, you just said something, but I just, um, I, I, uh, you said, Christian, not Jews, but it inclusive of Jews. Jews right. are Christians. Okay. Exactly, exactly. In other words, the, their racial background means nothing. They can be Jews, they can be white, they can be black, they can be African. That means nothing. But of course, it's likely that Jews are in the number because Jews are Christians. Their identity is Christian. It has nothing to do with their, their, their physical characteristics. Those are irrelevant. They don't exist anymore in God's way of looking at people, in other words. Um, so, all right, what did I do? Brother David. Brother David. Brother David. Brother David. All right, you are, you are echoing a lot. I think that's Nikki, right? I did something here and I got a window here that is not supposed to be here. Let me see if I can get rid of it. Brother David. Uh, Yes, go ahead, Nikki. Um, the question that me and Mummy had was whether the mark of the become before or after the seven plagues of God. All right. Um by the time the seven last plagues come, everybody who is to be saved is already saved. Everybody who is not saved is lost forever. And remember that the mark of the beast is to be the great test. It will not only be the test that will, 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 will demonstrate we are. 
it's also the test and I, I, I'll need to I'll need a little bit more in the study so I'll just tell you briefly and we'll go into it in more detail as we, as we continue it's it's also to be the the crisis that makes people take a stand in other words there are many Christians today who are only half-hearted and there are many who are not Christians but they they they, they 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 have a heart that is towards God. The mark of the beast will force the world to make a choice. So so the mark of the beast is not to be after salvation is over. It's to during the time when the door of salvation is still open because it is to be the great factor that divides the world into two camps. After that, and then the door the door of salvation closes. And you have the seven last plagues, right? Would, would you would it be right to say then that would be right to, to say that the, the mark of the beast is would be actually the ceiling? Um, would it be that the ceiling would take this during this um, crisis? Right. So, so the ceiling I understand to be taking place at the same time when when the mark of the beast comes, then it is during that time that God's people are being sealed. It is in a time of trouble, but not yet the great day of God's wrath. It's a time of it's a time of I mean, if you want to find a place in Revelation where it is described, um, let me let me share that again quickly and just show you where it's, I, I believe it's described in Revelation. If you go to Revelation chapter. Um, chapter 11. It says. Um, I will give power unto my two witnesses in verse three and they shall prophesy a thousand. 203 score days clothed in sackcloth. I believe that this really has its primary application to the time when the mark of the beast crisis hits us. God's people represented here, here by the two witnesses, they prophesy or they, they, they give the message. And they are clothed in sackcloth, meaning that there is a great persecution. When we come to the study of Revelation 11, we'll go into this in more detail, but um, let me just mute everybody here because I'm getting some interference. All right, so um, David, I have a question. David, um, can I ask you something? David, um, yeah, Wayne, Wayne, and then Sister Anita. Um, in Daniel 12, uh, yes. we we see such a suggestion like there's a partial resurrection. Um, will those, if that's the case, will those be accounted among the one for the first A little later on, you're going to see where the, the, uh, John is told that this one for the four thousand are those who have come out of the great tribulation. Those who come up in the in the partial resurrection, they don't pass through the great tribulation, so they can't be a part of that number. I mean. I, I, I would like them to be a part of it. I would like to be a part of the one forty-four thousand. But everybody has its proper place in God's plan, and I, 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 every one of us is going to make it into eternity. We're all going to be saved. Peter and Paul will not be among the one forty-four thousand. Elijah will not be among the one forty-four thousand. I would have liked to be Elijah. I would have liked to be one of the apostles. But I'm getting my privilege, and they get theirs. We, we don't all have the same place in God's plan and God's purpose is for the last generation to display the fullness of the kingdom. We have a part. We have our privilege. I would like to be a part of it. Right. But at the same time, those those pioneer Adventists who died, whatever their place is, they never lived to see what we are going to see. They won't be a part of it because they never went through the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They never had that privilege. So that is not for them. And um, the, the partial resurrection that we see, yes, Jesus spoke of it. He says, he says that um, many of those that sleep in the dust of the ground, Jesus says that when he comes with clouds, even those who crucified him are going to come back to life. So, so God has this in mind, a partial resurrection right at the end. So there are certain privileges that people have, but it's different from being chosen to represent his kingdom in that last great crisis. So I, I, yes, Wayne, that, that's my thought on that. Sister Anita, go ahead. I think Sister Anita was trying to make a point. Are you there, Sister Anita? All right, we may have lost her. I don't think she would be shy to speak up. 
but um, all right, she will come back, no doubt. I'm still here. If you don't hear me, my uh, my internet is from them. But I'm here. Uh, all right, I hear I'm, you now. Go ahead. I'm here. What I'd like to ask? Are you hearing me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, what I'm asking? She just said um um the mark of the beast. Yes, is um is where God has given everybody upon this earth a choice. To either choose him or, or um I, I don't know, Sister Anita, maybe you could type your question. Type your question in the, otherwise. In the chat. So when is the harvest? Okay, I think I get the question then. All right. Um you, you cut out a bit, but I think I got the question. You're asking when is the Are harvest? You Are you yes, I, I, I got the question. I got the question. All right. So, um, my, my question, question is, I got the yes. question. When is the harvest? I got the question. Okay. All right. Um, let me just show you something very quickly here in response to that question. Okay. Um, we, we see the harvest in Revelation 14. It says that, um, it says, and I, in verse 14, Revelation 14, I looked and behold a white cloud. Upon the cloud, one sat like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And what follows is a harvest. But look at what it follows. It follows the three angels' messages. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. And the first one talks about the hour of his judgment is come. And the second one talks about Babylon is fallen. And the third one talks about if any man worship the beast and his image, and it tells you what will happen. And then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and so on. And, and then I looked and behold a white cloud and the son of man with a sickle in his hand. So the harvest takes place after the three angels messages. So the three angels messages, as it were, prepares the harvest. It separates. Remember what Jesus said in his parable. He says that in the time of the harvest. Okay. He will say to the messengers, gather first the tears in bundles to be burned and then gather the wheat into my barn. So the mark of the beast is the crisis that separates the tears and the wheat. And then the harvest takes yeah. place afterwards. And, and the, the tears are thrown oh. into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So yeah. that's a separating separating um, situation. Now, okay. let's go back um, to Revelation 7 and just continue where we were um but brother david just, yeah um just to say I, I believe that the 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 number itself is um is a literal number and it is is because i i have not found any precedents in the in the in the bible to um make a number be, be another number what i mean is that in the, in the in the prophecy of the uh, in the prophecies you you normally see for example 10 horns it is not the, the the 10 that is symbolic but the horn right so it we, we know that the, the horns represent kingdoms but it is a, is a truth or a fact that there are 10 kingdoms we know that there are seven churches. This is not the seven that is symbolic, but the churches. We know that there are um, 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 other numbers. One for four thousand. We, we know that there are twelve tribes. It's not the, the, the twelve that is symbolic, but the, the, the tribes of Israel. So I'm I'm not seeing where there is another number to be assigned to an, a number that is already given. While the numbers may be symbolic or mean mean something, they, they in, in themselves they are in my in my perspective they are also literal. So we know there there are seven church seven churches, not seven literal churches, but the fact is that there are seven. All right, good. So so they are not seven. I just say not literal seven. Not how literal. Many, not how literal. Many, how many churches are there really? No, I'm saying not literally seven. 
churches, but we know that the church is represent periods of time. But it, it is seven periods of time. So the seven remains seven. And, and, and in, in a sense, this is how we have interpreted it. When you say we know, yeah. what we know is that we have an interpretation. Because in, in, in actual fact, the literal truth is that there were seven literal churches in Asia Minor. Yeah. So, so how, we, how we interpret that, when we take the prophecy and interpret it and, 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 and make it and, and give it, put, set it within the framework of the bigger picture, there is a question as to how you interpret those seven churches. But we, we have set it in the framework of seven periods of time. However, I understand what you're saying. And I, I have objections in my mind are reasons that I would use to probably um, overrule some of what you said. But I will just li leave it there so we have those two opinions. <laughs> have those two opinions. Because um, I, think, I think that you can... You can I mean, you could apply that to the seven. I, I, I use examples of the seven horns on the head of Jesus. I mean, yeah. what, what it would suggest is that the only number that has a symbolic meaning is the is seven. You have the, 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 the 144,000 cubits that measure the holy city. Is it literally 144,000 cubits? If this is true, it looks like a cube because it's also 144,000 cubits high. It's, a, it's, a, it's square on all sides if you take those literal literal measurements so there, 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 there are some of the numbers that perhaps we could say we could make an argument that they are literal because um the context dictates that it is so but there are some of the numbers that that um if you if you if you apply it that way it really it really borders on on, on the incredible or even even um, ridiculous like for example the measurements of the holy city you know anyway um not, not to not to dwell on it too much, but um, I'm going to ask you to think about one thing, and I'd like you to give me the, an answer. If you have an answer later on, then fine. All right, but I'd like you to I'd like you to to suggest a reason why knowing a literal number could be helpful to us. I don't know if you ever thought about that question, but that's okay. that's the first question that comes to my mind. How because every bit of information in the book of Revelation, I believe, is 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 to is to help us. So if it if it can help, then it makes sense. If it's just interesting information, then it's like wasted information. So anyway, if you think of something, you you, you could share it with me. All right. Right. Um. So I'm going to go back to my my images. So the next thing I want to just suggest is. This is what John says he saw, or something like this. I'm sure he didn't see them with those um, T-shirts and those modern garments, but he saw a great multitude that no man could number. Now, remember, I made a point of, 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 of saying that he did not see this 144,000. I made a point of, of showing you that John is standing in heaven, and he says, I heard what he saw was four angels and then another angel and then he heard a number it's like he heard a voice say seal 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel he doesn't see anybody from the tribe of Judah 12,000 he doesn't see anybody from the tribe of Levi 12,000 doesn't see anybody from the tribe of Benjamin 12,000 and it goes down then he says after this I looked and I saw a great multitude that no man could number from every nation kindred tongue and people stand before the throne they are wearing white robes and they have palm branches in their hands now let me ask a question if you were john you're standing in heaven and you hear a voice talking about one fourth four thousand if you are like me the question that is in your mind is who are these people and where are these people? If, if, if God talks about a group of people who are going to be sealed and you are seeing everything before your eyes like a movie, what I'm looking for is who are these people? Instead, John sees a, a multitude of people out of every tribe, nation, and tongue. And they are standing before the throne and they are wearing white robes. Let me see if I can. I have, yeah, they are wearing white robes and they have palm branches in their hands. So actually, they don't really look like this. They look like this. 
but I wanted to, to use this picture to give you an idea of a great multitude. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the end of the story before we get to the end, right? It is my understanding. It's my understanding that these people and the 144,000 are the same group of people. In other words, this great multitude that nobody can, no man can number, is the same group that has been described as 144,000. And let me explain why I, how I come to this conclusion. First of all, th this description, a great multitude that no man can number, is there a number? I don't know how many people are going to are going to I don't know how many people are going to be saved, but I'm going to tell you this. If you give me long enough, I can count all the people who are going to be saved. It might take me six thousand years if I count one per day. <laughs> and I doubt it will take that long either. But I, I you you can count the number. There there is no such number of people who are going to be saved that nobody can number. In other words, when John says a great multitude that no man can number, he's using a human expression to tell you what he sees. He's expressing what he sees. If, if, if I ever went into town and I saw a crowd of people like this, when I come back home, so, uh, my wife says to me, how many people did you see? In Jamaica, we have a phrase. It's an old phrase, but sometimes people still use it. They say, I saw people like sun, like sun. When they say like sun, they mean vast numbers. Or I might say numberless, because that's another phrase that people like to use here when, when they're talking about a very large number. It's a man numberless. Or, or sometimes they say like dirt, people like dirt, people like sun, numberless. It's a human expression. And when you hear the expression, you simply mean, you simply understand it to mean it's a great number of people. It's a vast number. Now look at this picture that I have on the screen. Do you think we have 10,000 people there? I mean, that's kind of like a ridiculous question because absolutely not. What we have in this picture is not 10,000 people, right? I, I, I can't estimate numbers well, but I'm pretty sure it may not be even as much as maybe 2,000, right? Now, now, if you can imagine 144,000 people standing in one place, let's say it's a literal number, and you could imagine 144,000 people standing in one place, you would think that this is a multitude that no one can number. I've seen, I, I saw um, the stadium in London when, when, during the 2012 Olympics when Usain Bolt was running. I've, I've looked at some of these stadiums that hold up to 90,000 people. And when you look at the vast numbers, it's kind of like an exercise in futility to think about even trying to count the number. And that is what... Um, I believe this is what John is saying. He says, I saw a multitude that no man can number. Now, now the first group of people that he, 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 okay. The first group of people that he, that he, he referred to, all right? The 144,000. This number is not a number that he saw. This number is a number that he heard. The, what he saw before the throne of God is what he saw. In other words, what he sees and what he's hearing is not corresponding. This is not this is this is a device that God uses in the book of Revelation. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you in another in another place where the same device is used. Um, if you go to Revelation 5, John is about to cry because nobody is found worthy. No man is found worthy to open to read the book. And one of the elders says, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. So what does John hear? He says, he hears a voice that says, the lion, the lion has, open, has prevailed to open the book. He says, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood, stood a lamb. What do his ears hear? His ears hear the lion. What do his eyes see? His eyes see a lamb. It's not a contradiction. God is giving you two kinds of information about Jesus. 
one of those pieces of information you hear with your ears and the other information you see with your eyes. And if you're foolish, you think that this is a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. It's two different sides of the same coin. So you have this in Revelation in some places, and this is one of those places where God says one thing, and when you when John looked, he saw something else. It's the same picture from two two different perspectives. And I believe this is what happens in Revelation 7. It's God showing you this group of people from two different perspectives. And here is the important point. I'm going, I'm, we, we, we are still going to look at this more closely and further back up what I'm trying to say. Can you finish one minute, please? Go ahead, Brother Marlon. Go ahead, Brother Marlon. All right. Um, nowadays, people are saying that it's impossible for God to save 144,000 out of all the whole entire universe right now, the earth itself. The earth. But remember, um, in time of Noah, and remember taking um, that is just a little city still, which is they, they were just um, um, three persons saved from the city that burned. So, um, but, but nowadays, people is really saying that it's impossible for God to save or to, or 144,000 at the end because there's so much people who and there's so much church and so much so called religious, religious people nowadays that it's impossible for 144,000 to be saved from the earth, right? I mean, people, 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 people's opinion doesn't really mean anything. What, what means something is what what the word of God says, and it could be as few as 144,000, it could be less. In my opinion, from my perspective, from my understanding, it could be less, it could be more. But uh, Brother Frederick uh, thinks it's the exact number, and I know there are others who might think that way. I mean, to me, it's not a strikingly important question. It's not strikingly important whether it's literal or, 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 or a spiritual number, but I suppose it might be important because somebody might say, my, what a, what a small number of people. But what I, I understand that the main emphasis in this chapter is, is, is one thing. The question is, who is able to stand? And this group of people identified as the 144,000 is the subject of this chapter. There is nobody else who is, un, who is, who is concerned with that answer. Who shall be able to stand? Some people say that this great multitude is the redeemed from all ages. They don't belong in this chapter. They have no place in this chapter because this chapter is not asking who will be saved eventually. It's asking who will stand in the great day of God's wrath. So it's not two groups of people. It's one group. And John hears the number. Then he sees the number. Is it 144,000 or is it a great multitude that no man can number? It's the same. Whether it's 144,000, literally, if you saw 144,000 people standing in one place, you would describe it as, a, as, a, as a new, new, innumerable. You would say numberless. It's a number you can't really try to begin to count if you, see, if you see them at one glance. So I don't think it's literally a multitude that nobody can number. I mean, John is just saying, I saw a whole lot of people. And they are standing. Hello, Brother David. I have a question about the text. Okay, Nikki. Can you go back to the text where you were talking about the lion? All right. Yes, here we are. Why did you say that he didn't see the lion and he heard, he heard the lion and saw the lamb? I don't see where it says that he didn't see the lion. Verse 5, and one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Did he see a lion? Doesn't behold mean see it here, look at it? Yes. So when he looks, what does he see? And I beheld. He followed the command and he beheld. And what did he see? Stood a lamb as it had been slain. He didn't see a lion, he saw a lamb. So the man tell him to look at the lion, but when you look, he's not a lion, he's a lamb him see. Exactly. In other words, the, 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 the elder is saying, Jesus is a lamb and a lion. But I'm okay. only showing you the lamb, but I'm telling you that he's a lion. All right, thanks. So we get two, we get two, two aspects of Jesus' structure. 
in those two pieces of information. Instead of showing a lamb morphing into a lion or vice versa, he just says, look at the lion from the tribe of Judah. And when he looks, he sees a lamb. And the message comes across. Yeah, he has the characteristics of a lion. And also, he needs to be the lamb in order to save us. So, you know, it's God giving us information in different ways. And what I'm saying, the point I'm making, I'm sure you understand, is that the same device is being used here in Revelation when God talks about the, um, the 144,000 and the great multitude. I'm very much persuaded it's the same group of people. Brother D, I... Um... Brother David. All right, Brother Sean, go ahead, and then Brother Frederick. Yes. Yeah, um, well, if I was in John's position, um, and I heard those um, numbers being called, 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, I mean, based on my uh, um, analysis, upon seeing the multitude, this great multitude, next in line, then... Based on my um, human um, analysis, it would have been easy for me to come to the conclusion that it's 144, literal, if okay. that was the case. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, for John to say that he saw a great multitude that no man could number, mm -hmm. it seems, or it wants to give the impression that it is more, much more than 144. Okay. And not a literal number. I don't think John would have had much opportunity in his life to see a crowd of 144,000 in one place. We might be accustomed to it, but if I saw a crowd of 144,000 in one place, or more or less, I really wouldn't have be able to give you the first clue how many people there are. The, our stadium in Jamaica holds 30,000. If you ever go into halfway tree square when it's election time, you have no idea how many people are there. So I don't know. I don't know. How, how John analyzes this. But what I'm saying is that what, one of the things I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get across is that there is a difference between God's statement and John's statement. God never told John it's a number that cannot be numbered. I'm sure God wouldn't say that because God can number any number. God told John 144,000. When John looks at it and John says a, a multitude that nobody can number, that's not a real number. Because there's no such number that exists of people who will be saved. That's not a, that's not a number. That's a, an assessment based on what John sees. But anyway, there, there is more evidence to back it up. The evidence, I'm not out of the evidence yet. So as we go further along, you will see that it has to be. All right? So I've just, I've just, I'm just halfway through the evidence. You are going to yeah. say, Brother Frederick. Yeah, I, I must admit and confess that I also um, had difficulty with, I grapple with the numbers, right, with the 144,000 and the, the statement that there is a great, it, he saw a great multitude. And I agree with you that the great multitude, which no man could number that he saw, is the same people that the angel said would be sealed, right, the same 144,000. He only heard the number, but he, he saw, a great multitude that he says no man could number. And as it relates to numbers, you know where I found the answer for this? In the book of Numbers, a matter of fact, in the very first chapter. Now, <laughs> look look at um, the, the, the last um, verse um, 14. It says, and I said unto him, sir, thou knowest, regarding the, the group, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I see that the Levitical um, system, the, the answer is found in the, in, the, in the Levitical system that God set up. Matter of fact, those who wash their robes are those who were, 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 were to work in the temple. Matter of fact, it says in verse 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. This points to a specific group of people who had to wash their robes before they were entered into the to work or to serve God in the temple. And this points to the tribe of Levi. Now, as you read Numbers chapter 1, God says, we are going to number all those 20 and upwards who are able to go to war. And But don't number this one, the tribe of Levi. So it is not, it is not that the, the number is 
innumerable or no man is able to number it and i agree with you if it even that um 20 trillion there must be a system to number 20 trillion otherwise the number couldn't exist but what what god is saying is no man is authorized to number this group it is not that it is innumerable by man but man is not authorized to number it and that is why john only heard it but then he saw all right so if we look back in the levitical system then we we, we see exactly what what is going on here and, and the fact is um god did not intend to use levi only in the temple and that is why we see pointed out here with the 12 tribes because what god wanted was the firstborn of all the tribes of israel but since the the the, the abomination at the, the at mount sinai when moses said who is on the lord's side it was levi who stood up god said i don't want the firstborn again all right so so count out the firstborn and give me levi but god's intention was that it was the firstborn that was to to work or to do the work that levi did in the temple and so here we see god now um counting out the firstborn i mean not literal the literal firstborn of the tribe of israel but he's counting them out the first fruit, the first fruit of the tribe of israel so yeah as i say it is it is not that they can't number it but it is no man is authorized to do it because even david when he numbered israel he numbered also levi he shouldn't have, should not have done that that was one of the big great sins of david all right that's an interesting insight i never compared it to the um to the levitical system levitical system and or and and that part but that's an interesting insight and it's worth looking at more closely Thank um you. so here, here here is something to consider there's a quick there a couple of questions i want to ask i know our time is running down i'd like to finish this evening but um i don't want to rush too much so let's see where we where, where we get so the first question is how does john know that these people are from every nation kindred tongue and people now we can understand that the first statement the angel said to him hear the voice that says to number these people from the 12 tribes of israel so the first question i would ask is the 12 tribes of israel are those jews well obviously we're talking about spiritual israel so they can't be jews how does john know that these people are from every nation kindred tongue and people well if i look at this group here on the screen before me i see mostly white people so it'll be kind of hard but if i look at this group if i look at this group and i ask you which nation do you think these children are from you'd be kind of hard put i mean today we have a uh we have the integration of the races in different nations so this could be jamaica it could probably be the United States of America because you have nations integrated. But if I ask you, if these were literal Jews, they wouldn't look like this because Jews are very racially distinct because they, 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 they don't mix, right? You have some, some groups like this. But it, John probably knew that they were from all nations, kindreds, tribes, and tongues because when he looked at them, he saw Chinese, he saw white, he saw black, he saw Indian, he saw different colors and different hairstyles and different groups. So he knew they were from all nations. Remember, it's not God who told him that, that, where they are from. He's describing what he sees. After this, I looked and I beheld from all nations. So he's looking and he sees. Now, look at these children. Are they Jews or are they Gentiles? And you will answer. It depends on whether we are speaking in a literal sense or in a spiritual sense. If you are dealing with the old covenant, these could not be Jews. They would have to be Gentiles. I don't know if any Jew might be among them, but definitely they, they couldn't be all be Jews. They would have to be Gentiles. But if you're dealing with the New Testament, every one of them could be a Jew because a Jew in the New Testament is somebody who is born again. It's not somebody based on a racial category. So if we, if we think about this and go back to the images that we looked at before, this great multitude from all nations kindred time and they could be jews they could be from the tribes of israel they are spiritual israel they are not really spiritually they are not from every nation kindred uh, tribe and tongue spiritually they are from israel if they are obviously they are saved people right because they are standing before the throne with white robes in their uh, uh, with white robes and they are they have palm branches they are israel this is israel 
So the 12 tribes of Israel that were mentioned before are not distinct and separate from this group, this innumerable group. It's the same Israel. Same Israel. There's no difference in terms of identity. They are all Israel. And as I said before, nobody has a place in this chapter except those who will be able to stand in the great day of God's wrath. Now, the next thing that, that, that I want to focus on, I'm going to go back to the Bible and I'm going to try to finish in 10 minutes because I don't want to keep us too long on a complicated subject. But let's go back to the Bible. And let's go back to Revelation 7 and look at some things that are said here. Look at this. And one of the elders in verse 13, well, even before I go there, I just want to share something interesting. This, what, this, this group of people before the throne, who I say is the one 44,000, they have white robes and they have palms in their hands. They cry with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, who is he? Salvation to our God, the Trinity, which sitteth upon the throne. One of the strong places in the Bible where you see clearly that God is not a trinity. Somebody's in heaven looking and he sees the people who are finally saved and they are not worshiping a trinity. They are not calling a trinity God. They say salvation to our God who is sitting upon the throne and to make sure that they mean one person exclusively, they add and unto the lamb. The lamb is not the God. It's not our God. He is the son of God. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. God on the throne. There's brother one brother God. D. Yes, Brother Frederick. I, I hate to interrupt, you know. <laughs> I agree with you, you know. <laughs> I hate I to know. be. I, I don't like it, you know. I, 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 like, I like that way. In a card, but I mean, I, I agree with you. It's just that I want to highlight something here before you go, so that it brings a little more strength to what you're saying. In verse sure. ten, it says, "It says that um, bring 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 up verse ten again for me. Let me see. It says, and they cried, the Lord voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. It shows that chapter six and chapter seven are connected. They are not 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 two separate um separate um thought because the, the very the very end of chapter six says that the, the rich and the poor and the bond and the free were hiding from him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. They, they want the rocks to fall on them. But the people who are able to stand are given honor and glory. So you have two groups of people and the two and, and it is two the two types of responses to the same event. Okay. Once one is hiding are asking for the rocks to cover them, while one, the other set, is actually giving honor and praise to the one who sits on the throne and the lamb. Amen. So it's the same event. Okay. Yes. In verse 13 now, it says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, John is still in heaven. And this is one of the 24 elders who, who is around the throne. So he's right there in heaven. One of the elders answered, I mean in vision, one of the angels, ans uh, the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? Now, who is he speaking about? I mean, he's speaking about the, the, the great multitude that is standing before the throne. They are the only people that he has seen, right? Apart from that, he has seen four, uh, five angels holding winds and with the seal of God. He has not seen anybody else. Now he sees the, the 24, the, 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 the great multitude before the throne. And the, the elder comes to him and specifically points his attention and says, these people, this great multitude from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue, who are they? And where did they come from? This is a subject that, they, that, that John is to focus on. And yet, the theme of this chapter is, who shall be able to stand? And John is specifically pointed to these people. John, of course, is befuddled, and he said, I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. Who, I, who, you asking me, I have not a clue. And he said to me, this is what the elder says. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. The King James Version does a disservice to this verse by leaving out a simple little word. It's in the original, it's in the Greek text. 
in, uh, the, from which the King James Version was translated. So it should have been there, right? Maybe it's just a mistake, right? It did not say, these are they which came out of great tribulation. No, because most Christians come out of great tribulation. It should say, let me point to the NASB. It says, these are they which, who, these are the ones who come out of, not great tribulation, the great tribulation, the great tribulation. These are not people from all ages. These are people from the final moments of time who have come out of the great tribulation. That is why this great multitude cannot be the redeemed of all ages. You have many people who have come out of tribulation. What about the people in the dark ages? What about those who were persecuted and, and killed by, by the Roman Empire emperors back in the early ages of church history? What about people like Isaiah who was put in a hollow log and sawed in, sawed in two? God's people have always suffered tribulation, some of them great tribulation. But the ones we are seeing here before the throne, this great multitude that no man can number, the ones in the white robes, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. There is only one such moment in the Bible. It's a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It's the great tribulation that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. It's the great tribulation that comes about when the great day of God's wrath arrives on this earth, right? These are the ones who have, who have come out of this, this great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, it's interesting that when you, when you, when you, go, when you go back a little further, let me go back to chapter 6. And chapter 6 talks about the judgment of the dead. Right? It says, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And look what it says happens to them. And there was given unto them, each of them, a white robe. These people receive a white robe while they are dead. And I, I, I'm not going to take the time to not, this evening to explain how that can happen. Or you can get a white robe when you are dead. But just to give you a clue that this apparently represents the judgment, right? The pre-advent judgment. They are given a white robe. But what about the 144,000? It says of these people, it says of this great multitude, which I believe to be the 144,000. I mean, the evidence to me is very strong. It says that these are the ones who have washed, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, these people experience the washing of the robes. Those who are dead, they are given a white robe. In other words, this perfecting, this perfecting element, th this white robe here does not represent simply the, the, the imputing of Christ's righteousness. It, it represents a, a place where you have come to the place where your character has been perfectly perfected. And it says that the ones who are already dead, the Christians are already dead, they are given a white robe. In other words, something happens to them while they are dead. But for this 144,000, they pass through God's washing machine while they are still alive. They pass through a great tribulation which purges and cleanses them because God has something in store for these people. God uses them as his, as his, his showpiece. He presents to the world in a moment of greatest darkness. He says, this is what the gospel really is intended to produce. And so these people, for this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. But Brother Frederick made a, a link there between the work of the, the Levites and that privilege. And that's a, that's a, a very uh, interesting connection there. But also just looking at, looking at it superficially, what it tells you is that these people, they have passed through an experience that nobody else has ever had. Nobody else has ever passed through this experience. This is a subject of the book uh, of Revelation chapter 7. And this is why I'm persuaded that the, the, the great multitude and the 144,000 are two different sides of the same, set, same people, same group of people, just two different descriptions. Both the great multitude and the, and the, and the, the, the number that John heard. They are Jews. They are, they, are, they are from the 12 tribes of Israel. The great multitude spiritually. And, and the, 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 the group that John heard audibly, 
right? They are audibly, they are, they are physically described, but we are also to translate that to spiritual. So it's the same group of people. 144,000, a great multitude that no man could number. Well, we have a disagreement whether it's a literal number or a spiritual number. In my opinion, in my opinion, to apply a spiritual interpretation is helpful. One of the things I've, I've learned about numbers in Revelation, Adventists have a way that they count, they add up the numbers, they, they, they assign a value to each letter in a, in, a, in, a, in a supposed title of the Pope. The Pope is supposed to be referred to as the Vicar of the Son of God. Adventists say that this, this name appeared on, on the triple crown of the Pope. This, 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 this triple crown cannot be found. If you do a, a search on Wikipedia or encyclopedias for the triple crown of the Pope with the words Vicarious Filii Dei, Nobody can find it. It's, it the, the, the Catholics deny that it was ever there. Um, now, is the Pope called the Vicar of Christ or is he called the Vicar of the Son of God? If you say he's the Vicar of Christ and you turn that to Latin, the numbers won't add up to 666. You have to be specific. You have to word it a certain way. Vicar of the Son of God and then you, you, you apply a numerical value to each letter and you end up with 666, and you have to apply zero to some of the letters. Now, it's, 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 it's convenient, but it's interesting that you can, you can use the name Ronald Reagan, and you end up with 666. You can use the name Ellen Goldwhite, and you end up with the same 666. To me, this is interesting. But for me, the number 666, it's focusing more on some spiritual characteristic. And I believe if you apply, if you approach the number in this way, you come up with something that is more helpful. But anyway, I won't go into that this evening. I won't go into that this evening. Um, Plus, I think I, David, yes, Sister Diane. I was thinking, um, I don't know how we can apply that verse to the first beast when it's talking about the second beast anyway. 666 does not apply to the first beast. We make it apply to the first beast. But if it were to apply to the first beast, it should be, it should be at verse 11, at the end of verse 10, following the description of the first beast. But it's not. It's at the end of uh, verse 11 through 17, which is all dealing with this, what's going on with the second beast. Um, okay, I understand what you're saying. Um. If, 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 I think I think you, I think I think if we look at it closely, it can be made to apply to the first beast. But um, I don't think we have the time to look at it this evening because it's going to drag us off a little bit, and I think everybody is already tired. So I don't I don't think it's right to cram every uh, cram so much. But if you bring up that point next week, we 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 can look at it again. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to in the interest of temperance, I'm going to um, call our discussion this evening to a, a halt. I know that um, there may still be um, some unanswered questions in people's minds, but um, when, when I close, after we close, and um, I'm, I'm going to ask that if anybody has uh, something else to say, we can discuss it kind of like freely. And um, but I want to give those who who, who wish to go. The opportunity to leave because I think we can overdo it a little bit if we go beyond. It's been an hour and a half, and that's more than enough. All right. So let's just bow our heads and give thanks, and then we can continue kind of um, free form afterwards.